in terms of backlinks, the best type of backlinks are backlinks from sites that are related to you. So if you're just getting any random website to link to you, it's probably gonna do more harm than good. If you're a doctor and you're getting a backlink from a website related to health, medicine, that's what matters. So that's where you gotta figure out, all right, how can I get on other related sites? Maybe you write, you could blog for them, you could do podcasts, you could do content marketing, you could do videos for them, you could sponsor events, I mean, a lot of different ways. That's why looking at your competitors is gonna really help you figure out what they've done, is just spy on your competitors' backlinks. I would like to give some kind of general sense to the people, like if they wanna understand how SEO works, what's important, what's not, what are some general things that they should be thinking about to understand what matters for you know, having a better performing website? There are so many things. Google has over 200 ranking factors that go into the algorithm. But I always tell people SEO is like a puzzle. A lot of pieces to this puzzle, but some are a lot bigger than others. Like content is one of the more important aspects, meaning text. Google can't really read images or videos yet. They're getting better at it, but they really rely heavily on text. The more text you have on each page, the easier it is for them to read, understand, and know what keywords you're targeting on that page. But unfortunately, they don't really care what you put on the website because they don't trust you. They don't trust anyone. So what they want you to do is build that trust up. And the way to build trust up is by getting what are called backlinks, getting other websites to talk about you. The more backlinks you have from relevant authoritative sites, the more trust Google's gonna give to you and then they look at those keywords on your website to figure out what to rank you for. But it doesn't work the other way around. Without backlinks, Google's not going to rank a website. So, for example, like a backlink would be if you're reading an article on the New York Times, and in there it says Brandon Leibowitz, and you click on it, and it goes to my website, I'd be getting a backlink from the New York Times.com. So the more websites that list you, the more trust you're going to be able to get from Google. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for us... Saying that is helpful, but I'd like to know what are some of the things that even maybe you do for yourself or you have some of your clients to do to get those because saying, you know, go to New York Times and give us a link, that's easy. But like, what are, what do they actually do? What are some good strategies to build up a better backlinking, you know, kind of influx? Yeah, the best way to up your backlink profile is do competitive analysis, research your competitors, search on Google, see who's on that first page of Google for your keywords, skip over the ads, but make note of all the ones that are in the organic listings and then throw them into different tools such as Ahrefs or Moz or SEMrush. Kind of just pick one of those tools. They're all going to do the same thing, which is looking at their backlinks. So they're all paid. You have to pay for them, but they help out so much because if your competitors are on that first page of Google, it's more than likely because of those backlinks. And if you could look at their backlinks and then try to figure out which ones are relevant, authoritative, and then reach out to those sites, that's gonna get you to the level that your competitors are at. So I would try to figure out, like if you see that they got an article on the New York Times, see who wrote that article, see what that article is about. Maybe it's like they got a quote from that person or they have a top 10 list of companies to look out for. And, if your competitors are in there, there's a way you could potentially angle it and pitch it to that writer, or maybe you saw that they sponsored an event or did a trade show or joined like the BBB or Chamber of Commerce or whatever needs to be done. But you can pretty much look at their strategies because there's an infinite way to build backlinks. But what matters is looking at your competitors and trying to figure out which ones they built that are relevant and authoritative. Got it. Yeah, I like that. So if I look up my website, brandsonbrands.com, in a tool like hrefs, which is ahrefs.com. I type in my thing, It'll there's a place to check my backlinks and it might say, okay, this random XYZ website referred to, well, my content, if it's me, that's someone checking me as a competitor, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then it, my competitors could look at that and say, okay, well, Brandon was listed here. I want to also be listed here and to your point, reach out to that person directly or try to, if it's a ranking, like I show up a lot because of like podcast rankings, it's, you know, 10 best branding podcasts or something like that. I show up in the list. So it's like, how do you show up in that list instead of me or higher than me or whatever, and also end up in that same place and get that same, same listing. Are there some listings that are better than others that have more power or strength than others? Well, yeah, some are better than others, but like you said, with the lists, like one way you can angle it is 
maybe those lists have websites that are no longer in business. And you'd be like, hey, here's a top 10 list of branding podcasts, but this one's not, lo- this podcast is no longer active or if they've taken it down, can you add mine to that list? So there's always ways to try to angle it and figure it out how to get in there. But in terms of backlinks, the best type of backlinks are backlinks from sites that are related to you. So if you're just getting any random website to link to you, it's probably going to do more harm than good. So you need relevancy. Relevancy is the biggest aspect of Google's algorithm and with the backlink. So if you're a doctor and you're getting a backlink from a restaurant, that looks a little strange. But if you're a doctor and you're getting a backlink from a website related to health, medicine, it doesn't have to be exactly what you're doing. As long as it's somewhat related to what you're doing, that's what matters. So the more related, the better. But as long as it's somewhat related, that's what Google's looking for. So... That's where you got to figure out, all right, how can I get on other related sites? Maybe you write, you could blog for them. You could do podcasts. You could do content marketing. You could do videos for them. You could sponsor events. I mean, a lot of different ways. That's why looking at your competitors is going to really help you figure out what they've done is just spy on your competitors' backlinks. Now, what if, because what I imagine is I start type start typing in my competitors. Their optimization also sucks. They aren't ranking either. <laughs> So how do you figure out who to even be looking at the backlinks of? Well, no. So when I say competitors, I mean, who's ranking on that first page of Google? You might be a restaurant and there's 20 other restaurants in the city, but if none of them rank on Google, they're they're competitors offline, but I'm talking about online competitors. And let's say you're a restaurant and you search for your keywords and Yelp ranks at the top. That is technically your competitor, even though it's not another restaurant. So Whoever's on that first page of Google for your keywords, those are your competitors. If a Wikipedia appears or Amazon or stuff like that, and you're just like, this isn't really my competitor, but if Google is showing them for your keywords, those technically are your competitors online, but offline is going to be much different. So when we talk about the actual execution end of this, as you're taking on new clients, for example, where do you typically start? Like you're having a new conversation with someone. What can they expect to be, you know, part of that conversation in the beginning? I would do a website analysis. That's the first thing is always do a free website consultation and check out their website versus their competitors, really looking at their backlinks versus their competitors' backlinks and seeing what the disconnect is and how much time and effort it is going to be to get them up to that level. Like if they're a brand new website, they don't have any backlinks, but their competitors have a couple thousand backlinks. It's going to take a lot of time and got to really figure out how to get them there. But if they already have been established and have a couple hundred backlinks and the competitors have a thousand backlinks and the strategy is going to be a little bit different because you've already built some of that foundation and it's going to be a little bit quicker and easier to get those rankings. Let me, then let me go down that road with you a little bit. So you've given us one tactic for getting our backlinks stronger, which was to find other places and reach out and kind of re- try to replace or re- repeat things that are, that other people are doing. What is another way to get more backlinks starting to show up for your website? Uh, you could look at your competitors' backlinks and find or find broken links that used to be working and try to reach out to those sites that they have broken links on. So you could look at your competitors and see all their backlinks, and then you could see which sites are linking to your competitors, but sometimes they might be linking to a broken page on your competitor's website. So you could tell that website, hey, you're linking to a broken page. I created some content that's the same or not the same, but like similar and think that this might be a better link since this one that you're linking out to is a broken link. You could buy expired domains or your competitor's website. So if you know your competitor is going out of business, buy that website, real one, redirect it to your website and you'll probably get maybe a little bit less than half their SEO value. Used to work a lot better. Too many people kind of exploited that one. But that one is a great one where you just go on like GoDaddy, find expired domains, look at their backlink profile if it's relevant, and buy that domain, 301 redirect it, and you'll get a fraction of those backlinks that will now be counted towards your website. But definitely the competitor one. Like, you know, your competitors are going out of business, jump on that URL, buy it right away, and then that's going to pass on some of that value, the SEO value. Awesome. I appreciate that. Now, content, obviously... In my world, content is king, but I'd like to know what your perspective is on how content helps, hurts, or neither. What role does content play in search engine optimization? 
Content is king for SEO. Ever since I've been doing SEO back in 2007, that's why I always heard content is king and content is the most important thing. Well, content meaning text. Google struggles to read images, videos, audio. They're getting better at it, but they're not there yet. So they really rely heavily on text. And the thing with text is it has to be original. You can't just take text from one page to another or from Facebook to your website. It becomes duplicate content. So whoever publishes the content first, they get all the credit for it, and they're going to get the rankings. Everyone else that repurposes it is probably going to get hit with the penalty. So you have to have original content. That's so very important. And there's tools like Copyscape. So if you're paying writers, you can make sure it's original content by using like Copyscape, which I think is like eight cents to check a website URL or check a couple hundred words of text to make sure it's original. And Copyscape is a free tool. So if you see anything that pop, I mean, for your eight cents, pretty cheap, but if you see anything that pops up on there, you can definitely know that Google's going to be picking up on that because Google's much more advanced than Copyscape. And I mean, right now, Google's having a bunch of issues with like AI written content. So they're trying to figure out, differentiate between AI written content and human written content. And they don't want you to have AI written content, but it's kind of hard to differentiate the two because nowadays it looks so realistic and it's easy to read. Whereas back in 2007, there are these things called article spinners that would just like find synonyms and replace them with other words. And it made the content original, but you couldn't read it. It was just like a bunch of gibberish. It didn't flow. But nowadays, you can't even tell the difference. So that one's kind of interesting to see how Google is going to be able to figure that one out and pick it out. But definitely making sure it's original content and text. That's going to be the most helpful, especially like for podcasting. If you're doing a podcast, if you could transcribe it, it might not be possible if it's a really long one. But if it's a really long one, you could timestamp it and have like a little summary above that, just having some text there really helps out. Yeah. So if someone's out there creating content, creating a lot of content, whatever it is, I imagine there's some best practices for SEO in terms of how you're creating the content as opposed to just creating randomly all this kind of different stuff. There's got to be some best practices that, because, you know, what I create with a plan versus what someone else creates random Hopefully, Google doesn't look at those as the same value. No, no. So, yeah, it's really about thinking about the user experience. So, in the past, it would be like, let's write 400 words of content for every single page. But now it's, let's write enough content that's going to answer or solve the problem that someone's searching for. So, someone's searching for, like, what's two plus two? I don't need to write 400 words about that. You could probably get away with it in a couple sentences. But if someone's searching for, like, how to, fix a flat tire on my car, probably put a couple thousand words about that. So it's all about just thinking about the user experience and offering the best experience for them and offering the user what needs to be there without adding all this extra fluff. And in the past, it was, yeah, let's put keywords in here. 3% of the text should be keywords. But nowadays, it's not putting keywords in the content, just write for people. That's really the best is write for people and your keywords should naturally emerge. And if they don't emerge in that text, then you're probably not writing the right content. So don't worry about putting those keywords multiple times or mixing it up. I mean, it's good to put synonyms and plurals and try to do other variations of those keywords and spread them throughout the content, but really focus on people nowadays. Don't focus on Google. So a lot to think about today. Any final words before we uh, let you go today? Uh, I would just say be patient with everything. It all takes time with digital marketing. It's unfortunately not immediate, especially with SEO does take time. So just be patient with it all. Give it some time and keep working it. As long as you're sending the right signals to Google, you'll start seeing your traffic slowly moving up, but just be patient with it all. Don't expect immediate results. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it, man. And that's again, Brandon Leibowitz from seooptimizers.com. And thank you everyone for listening today. Thank you, Brandon, for sharing your perspective with us. And as always, keep on tuning in each week and we hope to hear you, see you, and have you listening next time. Brands on brands.